But coming back to this, the first thing we've got yeah. to get into, right. which I say to everybody, is we've got to get into the schools. That's where this has come from. When I was running for the seat of Ballina, every person under 30 walked over and took a Greens How to Vote card. Mm -hmm. They've mm -hmm. all been indoctrinated. They all believe that the Earth's going to end, that carbon, that human emissions are bad for the planet, um, that dams mm -hmm. are bad. Uh, everything that the Greens put out, their people are, are lapping up. Mm, I, so, I related this anecdote just in the in the comment section of my of my Substack post where I I um I asked for you know my readers to submit their questions ahead of time. Um, so so what what happened was as i said to you i was i was on board with the climate change narrative until um until the scandemic and so it was about must have been toward the end of 2020 um my daughter walked in you know walk, uh, walked in the door She'd been at high school you know having some um some presentation or, or other on how climate change was going to kill us all and and i said to her you know I used to be really, really on board with that, but I'm, I'm, I'm reading and learning a lot of things that actually question that. Well, she flew into, I can only describe it as an absolute rage. Um, she was, she was horrified that her parents were climate deniers, right? And my husband and I were just like, Ooh, what the heck has happened here? Um, and so, yeah, I, I gave her some, you know, some websites, people like Judith Curry and so forth, and said, you know, just take a look at this. And she just went straight to the usual, you know, fuck checker websites and said, oh, this has been debunked. I'm like, oh, we've got real problems here. Now, you know, fast forward three years and, and, and she thinks the whole thing's bollocks. But what happened was she finished high school. So she wasn't being propagandized every day in the classroom. And she started looking things up for, for herself and discovering, oh, yeah, this whole climate narrative that I've been sold at school, um, there's a lot of holes in this so yes um i agree school schools are such a major major problem and I, I i i would i would argue with you here they're not teaching bad science they're teaching something like anti-science to these poor impressionable kids who who quite frankly have not been equipped at all with critical thinking skills um that that's yeah. just just not that's a thing right. in, in our schools yeah um mm. so we so, need to focus on the schools and and by the way in the schools they're being taught that the early settlers of Australia massacred all of the Aborigines. Mm. That That is so far from the truth, it's not funny. Uh, mm. And I know this is off topic, but I'll give you a little statistic because I'm, I'm, in fact, I'll tell you a few things. Firstly, I was put into foster care when I was three. I was one of 30,000 white children who went into foster care. Mm -hmm. So I've taken a particular interest in the so-called stolen generation and it is utter bunk. There was never a stolen generation. There was a salvage generation. And if there is any sort of criticism that could be levelled at Australian society is that we did not also rescue full-blood Aboriginal children from the deplorable circumstances in which they were placed. Instead, we only took children who were of mixed race into in this particular uh, program. Uh, so, so it was very yeah um well when you say deplorable circumstances again sorry we, <laughs> um that, better make the answer to this fairly you, brief because <laughs> you can actually go and get the files if they were if they will release them every every state was responsible for aboriginal affairs so this so-called program was being done by every state and, and in some ways different. But the first thing is that no child was ever taken out of its environment without first having a magisterial uh, hearing, e.g. in front of a magistrate, right? You had to actually go and plead a case to say, look, this child is in these circumstances and if we don't remove this child from this situation, this child will likely die. So circumstances like what? I mean, you know, are we talking... Okay. In the in the when uh, the stolen generation industry tried to mount a court case, they put forward two people to be their poster children. One was Peter Gunner and the other was Lorna Cabillo. Peter Gunner was the son of a kitchen hand called Topsy, who was 14 years of age when she had Peter Gunner. She took Peter and put him in a rabbit hole where he was covered in ants and was being eaten by the ants when the station inspector, hearing cries, found him down the rabbit hole, pulled him out, and he went off and was adopted, right? Lorna Cabillo, her father had long left her. By the way, all of these children, none of them had a father. The father had gone. 
a white father typically had disappeared. Right. Right, it was a right, station right. hand, so a fencer so a white, or whatever. A white man had impregnated a, a an exactly, Aboriginal, an Aboriginal girl. girl. Yeah, right. Girl and the Aboriginal or, girl was then uh, suffered a terrible uh, deprivation on the part of the tribe because the tribe wasn't impressed at having a child of mixed race in the tribe. Yes. Okay. Um, so she was on the back foot already. But mm. Kabila, her father nicked off, and her mother died. And as a consequence, she was being looked after by her grandmother. Mm -hmm. And the authorities approached her grandmother and said, look, could we take your daughter, take your granddaughter and put her in a school up in Darwin? And this they did. And so Lorna got a good education at public expense. And then later at about 17 years of age or whenever it was, she came back to the station. Mm -hmm. So in other words, these two uh, exemplar uh, things failed. As a as a um, as a court and what, and what what you just described. So these these were uh, this was testimony that that was heard in court. Um, so all this is verifiable. What, what yeah yeah yeah. It, it, look up Peter Gunner case of Peter okay. Gunner and Lorna Kabila. Um, okay. Now okay. the um, Gary Johns, who was an ex Labor minister, wrote a fantastic book, which is Self Determination: White Man's Dreaming. I recommend it to everybody. I've read it from cover to cover twice. I've also listened to Gary talk. He's a great fellow and his heart is absolutely in the right place. And he brings this up. He says that the, the stolen generation is a huge fraud perpetrated on the Australian public. Interestingly, the New South Wales Liberal National Party government awarded $20,000 in compensation to the so-called victims of stolen generation. Yep. No trial. No, in there, no, no research into whether they deserve to get the twenty thousand dollars or not. Mm. It was that the normal sort of crap that we get from the government, such as putting the Aboriginal flag up on the Sydney Harbour Bridge and it costing us something like two million dollars to put the flagpole up there or something. Good this, God, I had no idea. This, this is so this, nuts. These people, as I say, are absolutely chronically stupid. And they are destroying this country because how can children have pride in our country when they're being told that we did the most hor horrendous things to Aborigines when in fact exactly the opposite is the case. I'll give you another example. Between 1788 and 1900, there were 8,000 hangings approximately in Australia. After 1846, Hanging for property theft was disallowed, abolished. They still hang you for homicide. Mm -hmm. In the, between that date and 1900, over 50% of the homicides which came before the court were Aboriginal men killing Aboriginal women. Over 50%. Only 2% of the hangings were Aborigines. The rest were white people. And in fact, there's a celebrated case where two cases occurred at the same time an Aboriginal man killed his wife deliberately, murdered her. He got a couple of years prison and a white man killed his wife in a rage and he was hanged. And they, and they, and people made a big fuss about this because there was definitely from 1788 through a two-tiered system of justice. And my family has been a victim of this as well. My eldest brother was murdered by two supposed Aborigines. He had his head beaten in by a brick and then a tire iron in order that they could steal $128. The reason oh. these guys were out on the street was because as Aborigines, they were given preferential treatment and bail, whereas if they had been white, they would have been kept locked up because they were actually pending a hearing for another vicious assault. Right. Right. Okay? So when I hear people, you can understand, I get a bit emotional about this. When I hear no. people... Yes, okay. how badly we've treated the Aborigines. Yeah. Sure, there are murderers and there are dreadful people in white society. No argument. Yeah. But in, okay. in most of the instances yeah. where Aborigines were killed, it was in retaliation for what they had done. And, and sometimes that retaliation was excessive. Because yes. when when and of course, got... when, when, when you're armed with, with with guns, you can do a lot exactly. more damage than people who are armed with exactly. guns. And knives. Yeah, yeah. And there's and a I'm... celebrated instance of Wills. I'm trying to think of what his first name was, but he was the guy who organised the first all Aboriginal cricket team to tour the UK. Well, a couple of months before he did this, 
his brother and about 22 other settlers were butchered in Queensland, out, I think out from Rockhampton, by a tribe of Aborigines. For no reason, they descended upon them and killed all of them. Now, when the settlers heard about this, they went and killed about 30 Aboriginal males. Mm -hmm. and, and that's understandable because it certainly wasn't one or two Aborigines that turned up to kill the 22 settlers. And it happened that Wills just escaped that because he was sent down to Brisbane to get stores or something. So he wasn't there when the Aboriginal tribe turned up and butchered these people. Yeah. So, you know, this, it's not pretty. I'm not for a moment. No, it, 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 it's not. And, and, you know, and unfortunately, this, this is what happens whenever, you know, one, one people, one eth ethnic group, whatever, enters the territory of another exactly. you get clashes like this I, I think it's also sorry we're going way off topic with with climate change but you know i learned just recently that they are actually that, related that, by the way that, wait, this is all related into a collage the climate yeah I, I do agree with that you know just recently i i learned that there's very strong evidence that there are actually three rather rather distinct um um uh genealogies let's just say of of aboriginal people um we actually had pygmies i never knew that so they're actually pygmy people who were described as as, as right. Negroid. and then there were there, there were two sort of distinct um like very very genetically different uh peoples who who came down um from from southeast asia and, and and populated this country and and so th these occurred in three successive waves and of course what happened was when the second wave came in they you know murdered or otherwise displaced you know, what usually happens of course is is the the incoming people who are technologically superior um they they murder the men and then they kidnap the women and then they start intermingling right um That's and right. so it's, it's there, there is nothing kind of you know unique about the the aboriginal people that they, they engaged in that kind of displacement of, of other um of other lineage groups as well and that, and, that, and that's not to justify you know colonialism um there are many you know many horrific uh um um acts that that, do, that took place because of colonialism and the the attitude of of you know white superiority that 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 drove colonialism like i'm not denying any of that i'm just saying like this is a sad feature of humans where we're pretty awful apes really you know we're far more like chimpanzees than bonobos you know the bonobos sit, sit around you know having sex with everyone male <laughs> you know um male, male chimps having uh, male bonobos having having sex with with other males females having sex with other females Males, females, like whatever, right? So they 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 make love, not war. Um, chimps are very warlike, and we are sadly much more like chimps than we are like bonobos. So you know, humans, we've done a lot of things that that are that are really pretty bloody awful, um, and we continue to do them. Again, you know, have a look at what what's happening in the Middle East right now. Anyway, um, my point is, some terrible things were done by by white settlers to to Aboriginal people. Some terrible things were done by Aboriginal people to white people. Some terrible things were done by Aboriginal people to other Aboriginal people. Um, um, as, as you pointed out. I, I have to tell you that it was like we're talking like a factor of 10. The Aborigines butchered other Aborigines. Even a large number of the massacres, that so-called massacres that happened here were actually Aboriginal mounted police who, who instead of having saltpeter in their guns put ball to kill other Aborigines. We have good reason to be very proud of what we, how we settled this country the letters patent from george the third instructed arthur philip to look after the native people to treat them gently and this he did he arthur philip was subjected to spearing in the shoulder by benelong in retribution for him having kidnapped benelong in order to try and make contact with the aboriginal tribes after being speared governor philip took no action against benelong and they mm -hmm. became firm friends to the extent that when one of Benelong's wives died, leaving an infant daughter, he brought that daughter over to Arthur Philip and asked Arthur Philip to adopt the daughter, which Arthur Philip, mm -hmm. and as a consequence, Arthur Philip was then named Woolawawi, which means a member of the Woolaware, which was the clan that Benelong belonged to. This is an incredible history when you mm -hmm. look into it and you never hear this in school. 
No, it's, quite the opposite. White people bad, I, black I people good, black people all noble and kumbaya and whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, we have good reason to be very proud of the way our administration has treated the Aboriginal people. We have really good reason to be proud. And yet you would wrong. not believe that. I, 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 know, I, know Keith, I know Keith Winshuttle has, has written a lot about, about about this early history. And I'm wondering if there are any other particular authors that, that you would recommend to, to um, my listeners who... The, um, the, the Diaries of Wadkin Trench will give you an indication of early settlement. And, yep. and the issues that they faced and the challenges they faced. Also, the journal of William Buckley, who lived with the Aborigines for quite a number of years, gives you an insight into what life was like as an Aborigine. And believe me, it was, it was like mad, nasty, mad. nasty British and short. Yeah. It, it was very, I know, really, I, very bad. It was so, totally, Senator Jacinta Price has been really outspoken about the, about the yes. level violence in in aboriginal communities and how that is that you know you you cannot just attribute that to um you know to the effects of of, of colonialization on these people it, it's actually woven into into their culture um and lastly there is a book which i'm just now finishing coming to the end of um which is written by dr christopher reynolds and it's called australia what a capital idea and he takes a different view of why Australia was settled, and it was because of money and the idea that it might make money. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's a brilliant uh, book. I recommend it to anybody. I'm okay. actually, it's got lots and lots of typos and, and errors in English, and I'm mm -hmm. actually editing it, and I'm going to send it back to Christopher and say, look, this book is too good to stay in this state. You've got to fix yeah. up all these little errors. Um, because yeah. I really enjoyed it and I found it so useful. I'm particularly interested in where we got our constitutions uh, because I am political now. And I, I concluded that we ended up in this dreadful mess we're in because we have poor quality parliamentarians. Oh, we, I couldn't uh, agree more. My, my husband's an ex-lawyer and, and he is he just spits chips about the low quality of our constitution and how many things were left out of it that should have been in it. Yes, but look, we've got some really serious cracks in our constitution, which the Marxists will drive through. And I've already given you one, which is that politicians should be specifically prohibited from discriminating on the base of race or sex. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Thank you for using the word sex. Okay. Um, so, so, so uh, now, again, I'm going to play devil's advocate here. How do we educate the young? I mean, in the case of my daughter, um, who, who was full of fire and brimstone at the idea that, that, that she had climate skeptic parents. Um, how, how do we, how do we reach them? when they are being, you know, brainwashed, short of pulling them out and homeschooling them, which I'm all in favour of these days, and I, I, I wish to God I had homeschooled my kids. I don't know how I would have done it because I was working full-time when they were at school. But anyway, people seem to manage this. So so short of pulling them out of school and homeschooling them, how do we do this? Well, as a first step, you have to make a project. You have to make this a project. You have to be methodical and systematic. You have to gather around yourself a team of people who feel similarly inclined, who, who appreciate that the real problem here starts with the education system. The next thing you do is you write to the ministers for education in the various states and territories and federally pointing out to them that the syllabi, which is presently being taught to our students, is deficient or defective. When they don't take action, you then launch court cases against them funded by people who feel similarly, you actually take them to court. Because once you get them into court, you can produce your evidence and they can produce theirs and you can demonstrate to the court that they are not doing what they're being paid for. And that in itself is a crime. A, a government official is expected, it swears an oath in fact, that they will work in the best interests of the Australian public, of the public they serve, their constituency. And they are not doing this. And when it is pointed out to them and they still refuse to do it, then they get sued. And interestingly, if a public servant commits a crime, an actual criminal offence, they are not covered by any indemnity. If they How do much something confidence that's do you, wrong, do you have in the courts, though? I mean, we saw a lot of cases brought during the scandemic and, and, you know, almost almost to a man and woman the judiciary just just punished it they just said well you know we we believe the government experts 
and the government experts get up and they just they just spout absolute nonsense. None of it's referenced. And work then, in a different sphere. You see, the people who preside in a court are all arts graduates. It's arts and law. And if yep. you're going to be talking about history, that is their bailiwick. Whereas if you're talking about virology and, and such like, epidemiology, mm -hmm. they immediately put up defensive barriers. They, they so do you, their you, you think this one's winnable because, oh, yeah. because of the subject but, but matter? Also, you see, I've, I've actually had some success in that when I find somebody who actually pushes back, I say, look, have you got children? Yes. Mm -hmm. I say, well, don't you want your children to have a prosperous future because what's being taught now is destroying their future. I'd ask you to go away and think about what I'm saying. This is what I'm doing is actually in your interest. If you can construct it that way, if you can convince the person who is presently in the negative, hey, this is in my interest, in the interest of my, my children, my grandchildren and their successors, mm -hmm. then you've got a good chance of converting them. I would, have thought that, I would have thought that would be persuasive in terms of vaccine mandates, you know, but, but it wasn't. Well, no, because they had been told by experts that hydroxychloroquine doesn't work. Ivermectin yeah. and doesn't ivermectin work. Ivermectin is horse paste. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and so on and so mm -hmm. on, right? Mm -hmm. okay. In this instance, if we get a group together now, the next part of this is that on the periphery, there are schools out there that are receptive, and I would have teams like myself, I would go, I would have a, a polished presentation and I would ask to meet with all of the senior students and I would do a presentation, for example, on climate change or mm. on the fact that every administration from 1788 to the present day has done its best to help Aborigines assimilate into modern Australian society, and that is indeed... Ah, oh, but as soon as you say that, they the, the comeback is, well, that's just you being a white colonialist, you know? <laughs> that, I had this conversation. I actually... I actually pinched the person because they said, oh, that's genocide. I said, oh, I think Hitler said something about along those lines, wasn't it? Got to keep the race pure. Nah. <laughs> Ooh, touche. <laughs> yeah, I, I am mm, nice the antithesis comeback. of a racist in that I want everybody of different races to intermarry. A racist and, believes and, 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 in... And everyone should be able to avail themselves of the of the opportunity to exactly. raise themselves up. To exactly. Exactly. And, that, and this the, person had to back out of that discussion really quickly because suddenly she discovered, oh, shit, he's got a point. Yeah. And so I'm talking <laughs> I was about a racist, racist and I didn't realize it. Oh, my God. All right. Okay, so yeah. that's, that's how you handle this. Look, I and I made it really clear to this lady, I'm all for people marrying on the basis of love and mm. obviously compatibility, which is a part of love. Um mm. And, and I don't care what race they are, so long mm. as marriage is consensual. And, and I yes. want the marriages to endure because I really believe it's important for children to grow up with a mother and a father. Oh, I me too. Think, yeah. Nothing, nothing comes close to that, mm. right? Mm. Kids have that security. Yeah. So that's where my head is at. Anyway, so. Does that adequately answer to some extent how we would go? Yeah, about I, th I think it's, I think it's a good starting point. Yeah, I mean, there's there's obviously lawyers need to develop legal strategies for this, and but but that's that's perhaps <laughs> topic for another another conversation. Yeah. Um, yeah. Point to end all subsidisation of renewables. I am in favour of of ending government subsidies for absolutely everything. You know, absolutely. If, if an industry can't can't develop without those subsidies and and of course you know i'm assuming here that uh well see the problem is that that the existing when existing um uh um when existing providers say within it within a particular field are already subsidized then then that does kind of crowd out the competition that's the problem that that we face now where government has has played favorites and so it is really difficult for for new um competitors to emerge in the marketplace because the you know the existing competition is is so heavily subsidized but yeah i'm i i would just say end subsidies of every bloody thing the industry either either stands on its own two feet and and succeeds because it has a good product that people want um um, it offers something superior to the to the other product, or, or it doesn't, in which case it fails. Oh, well. Let me give you some, some sort of examples. Let's pretend that somebody wants to develop a coal mine west of Townsville, and I'm the government, 
and they say, look, would you help us develop the railway that we need to transport the coal from the coal mine to the Townsville port? And I would say, well, what's in it for me? I'm the government. What's in it for me? And they would say, well, firstly, we anticipate we're going to move a million dollars, a million tonnes rather, worth of coal every month. Uh, and that will bring something like $50 billion of foreign money to our country. I say, hmm, you're getting warm, getting warm. You say, oh, and as well as that, we're going to employ 20,000 people and we will be paying them an average wage of $100,000 a year and you will have a tax take of $20,000 coming, mm -hmm. which you would otherwise not have. Mm -hmm. So I sit down and I go, and let me think about this for a moment, 20000 multiplied by, holy mackerel, that's $400 million of taxation. Where do I sign? <laughs> uh, and, and, and let me get this right for a moment. You're, you're saying I have to spend $20 million to build a railway and I get $400 million back in tax revenue? Mm. Well, why are we delaying? Now, that, now, what the Greens do is they say, oh, you've subsidised the coal industry by helping them build a railway. I'm saying, no, 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 I'm a businessman. I'm doing this for the be benefit of the Australian people. I've just employed 20,000 people. I'm now mm. taxed at $20,000 a year mm. uh, and I'm earning $50 billion in foreign revenue that's going to be coming into this country. I think that's not a bloody subsidy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I, I, I take your point. I take your point. Okay. That, that's an investment. That's an investment by I'm government in, in the productive industry. I'm going to make it a dual railway. So then I can establish villages and so forth, and we can actually move product up and down the railway besides the coal wagons and yep. service the local graziers and so forth and disperse our population into and the Everybody else benefits. Yeah, and we decentralise, which, you know, is, is something that has been spoken about in this country for so long and it's it's, it's never, it, yeah, it's never happened. All right, so ending all subsidisation of renewables, I I am for that. Um, well, we, talk, we talked about the uh, the nuclear research. Before. Any other industry unless there's going to be a payback. You've got yeah. to have a good payback. Yep. Okay. Yep. And that and doesn't mean importing Chinese made solar panels in, in, in into this country. There's no payback. Yep. Yep. No yep. payback. Mm. Uh, take all statutory action to allow nuclear research and the nuclear industry in all its forms to flourish in this country. And that brings me back to my chief scientist from the Ukraine. He, he was right on the money. He opened my eyes. I'd never thought about the idea of renting nuclear rods. But if you rent nuclear rods to our neighbours, if they don't bring the nuclear rod back, then they don't get any more uranium. End of story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because we create yellow cake, it goes offshore and it ends up in a nuclear bomb. We've got no control of it. We've got no control if over it. end up in a nuclear bomb, then other uranium, which they would have otherwise used for nuclear energy, now ends up in a nuclear bomb. And this no. final point, to, to co-locate modular nuclear reactors at existing coal-fired power stations, the, the point there is that you don't have to build any more transmission lines, right? Yeah, you don't have to put in... Look, I, I actually built a half-megawatt pump station in for, on North Stradbroke Island for Constantinople Rutile, and I was responsible for all of the transformers up in the transformer farm and et cetera, et cetera, for all of the electrical reticulation. Um, there is a huge capital cost putting in a power station which is not related to the turbines and the gen you know, and the generators there's all the transformers the switching gear and there's the real estate and if you try to build a power station anywhere you can bet your bottom dollar there will be court case after court case mm, after. yeah the nimbys not in my years yeah. before you turn a sod whereas if you go into an existing power station no one can object and modular <laughs> uh, power uh, nuclear reactors can be transported in on semi trailers they yeah. are perfectly safe, and at the end of their life, they can be removed and dis disposed of in a fashion which is environmentally safe. There is no problem with disposing of nuclear waste in this day and age. None yeah, at all. Yeah, my um, my understanding of this is 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 that 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 waste can be reprocessed and then basically Absolutely. back into the reactor. Yeah, yeah. I had I a discussion with the head of nuclear energy in India, um, and that was really he, he was totally open with me. Um, and, and they're doing exactly what you say. They bombard nuclear waste with high energy particles to create actinides, which are useful for medical science. Uh, mm. they can encase it and drop it down a well. Uh, they can store it in heavy, in water, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There is no problem with mm. nuclear waste. None at all. Yeah. Wow. 
Wow. This is, um, um, thank you, Kevin. That was, that was absolutely phenomenal. And, uh, we've, we've been talking a long time, way, way past, you know, I, just got on, I said, I said, have you got an hour free, Kevin? <laughs> you know, three hours in. What you're doing is being very important. I will support you to the hill. It's simple as that. I think you're, yes. I think you're marvelous. I think you've got a terrific presence more strength to you and i will support you in any way i can i haven't got any money to give you at this moment but hopefully i'll get wealthy one day oh look i mean the, the, the for me i i i have kids i i have an 18 year old and a 22 year old and uh yeah i i, I want a bright future for them and uh, for me you know okay i mean the money is important because otherwise i can't continue to to, to do this work but it, the most important thing for for me is is being able to get information out to the public and so i'm just if you don't mind be keeping you just for a moment longer i am going to just quickly scroll through the uh through the through the various questions that were that were left on that um on that post that i put out to my readers to ask them you know what questions they wanted to ask you and i think we've covered oh so the, there were so many questions about geoengineering and I, I don't know if it if it's sort of you know within your your field of expertise obviously you know if you want to talk about geoengineering engineering that's a whole separate interview but but do you like in 30 seconds or less <laughs> what do you know about geoengineering is it playing a role in any of the weather events that, that we're seeing no um and and i can say that categorically i i have studied i you know salting of clouds using iodine uh, crystals uh, definitely when you salt clouds you cause nucleation and therefore you increase the probability of rainfall you have to actually have the moisture in the air beforehand. You can't magically create it. Next, mm. the idea that our airliners have got substances in the fuel which uh, cause such nucleation is uh, its not possible. And I tell you why. I told you before that I was the head of maintenance support for the Civil Aviation Authority. Mm. Uh, there are such stringent checks on uh, fuel that goes into aeroplanes. You would be mind boggled the the complexity of getting fuel into a plane because there are fungi there's water there are all manner of contaminants which get into the fuel which could cause an aircraft to become undone and and in australia we have a truly excellent safety record and that is because the people who are managing our fuel that goes into our aircraft are of the highest order mistakes do happen but the probability of a mistake happening in Australia is really, really slim. So what I'm saying to you is that there would be so many people involved in the contamination of the fuel to do the, you know, aerial spraying, if you're using commercial airliners, that one of them would talk, one of them would blow the whistle. Right? Yeah, because that's. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there are some people in my audience who 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 are thinking, okay, but then explain the Manhattan Project. You know, all these people involved in building a nuclear bomb. Surely one yeah. of them would have, would have talked, but they didn't. Yeah. Uh, is it is is it possible? Is it possible that there are people who are involved in this who don't really know? what they're doing i mean again i'm just i'm i'm, I'm being devil's advocate here i'm, I'm no, trying no, to anticipate my my audience's questions you mentioned the manhattan product it, it leaked there they they did talk there were there, there were secrets passed to um both the nazis and to the uh, japanese and to the soviets particularly the soviets yeah. But it's hardly surprising, I mean, considering how much, how, you know, how, how wealthy American industrialists and, and, you know, the money power in the city of London was actually backing Hitler. That's a whole other story. But yeah, so that, that doesn't shock me. <laughs> and also, you're in an environment where, uh, the newspapers were very limited. The ability to communicate was limited. Even people, a lot of people were not literate back in the 1940s. Uh, my, uh, wife's father, uh, was not good at literacy and her grandfather was illiterate. They, he, he lived at Drake and they used to have a writer that everybody would go to to read contracts and to write contracts and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So coming back to this, in the 1940s, there was very strong control of communications. Everything was censored. They were deliberately put into an isolated area um the ability for them to talk was extremely limited and also there was no real incentive for the majority the majority had signed up to this war were patriotic 
and would not do the wrong thing. Now, here you're talking about an aircraft refueler who gets paid an hourly wage and so forth, goes home to his family, knows what the consequences are, potential consequences of fuel contamination are, and would never allow it to happen, not on their watch, because they would be liable as well, not to mention that, you know, you'd have a plane going down. But that doesn't stop the RAF from doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you could use uh, military aircraft. But once again... I must, I must say, living in a rural area, I see some very, very strange things that ain't clouds across yeah. the... Across the and I can show you really strange cloud formations and I've actually taken the time to sort of lie on my back watching a jetliner go over and then seeing the pattern that arises from their jet trail, mm -hmm. you know, the vapor trail. Mm -hmm. And they, they are really, really quite beautiful, but they are, you wouldn't have guessed them. You know, some of them, they break up like dotted lines. Other ones swirl and turn into, you know, helicals. Um, it just depends on what the wind is doing up there. Gotcha. And we so so you're, what, what you're saying is is that these these are these are contrails, you know, not chemtrails, essentially. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're basically water vapor from the jet. Now, listen, there's another thing which is very interesting, and that is as a jet comes down to Earth, the speed at which it is flying around the Earth slows down. You know, the the mass of water that is released at a particular altitude is spinning around the earth at a different rate to when they're closer to the earth because the earth is rotating mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it depends where they're coming down of course but that too change it you get all sorts of it's like a kaleidoscope you know that yeah you yeah again we're looking at multiple variables that, that might affect yeah uh, how, how that how that um um, so I, I, I don't. I, I, I'm not saying that there weren't, for example, projects in Vietnam where they deliberately salted clouds in order to cause a quagmire, so as to slow down, you know, attacking forces and things like that. No argument. It can be done. It has been done. No doubt it'll be done mm. in the future. But mm. you know, I mean, you're, you're basically limited to the scale. This is a huge Earth we're on. And the chances of you being able to to do that are low. But I am worried by when Bill Gates starts talking about doing geoengineering in the upper yes. space using sulfur. Yeah, oh, injecting like various that. various compounds into the atmosphere. Yeah, doing yeah. it deliberately and putting aerosols in there because what he'll do is cool the earth down to a point where it'll be unacceptable. Yeah, where 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 life can't survive. Um okay, just scrolling through the questions, I think we I think we have pretty much covered uh let's see um uh I I really do think that we've covered everything in those questions if we talked about the uh about the arctic ice um all right that's yeah anyway <laughs> um so Obviously, I'll be putting this interview out once I edit it, and then no doubt there will be other questions that pop up. So um, I, I hope that you'd be willing to come back on again and, and just Absolutely. answer any any questions that come in. Um, once again, I want to thank you so much for being incredibly generous with with your time. We, we, we've gone kind of Joe Rogan length, here, haven't we? So I hope this was interesting and valuable for for my my listeners and viewers and and. Um, and, and and if it was interesting and valuable for you, the best thing that you can do is, is is pass it around to other people. You know, Kevin put a lot of work into that presentation. By the way, Kevin, um, you we we spoke about this before we hit the record button. Um, but you're happy for me to to put that presentation up, uh, where people can download it and look through the slides for themselves. Absolutely, absolutely. All right. Yep. Yeah. So this yep. is all created. I'll, 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 I'll give you the link to um, to where it is. And then you can do with it as you wish. It's yours. Right. So I'll I'll um I'll put the link to this in the uh in, in the Substack where I'll be putting out this this video. And uh yeah, these these are now your resources, everyone. So share them around. Sit your kids down when they come home from school, like my daughter did, all full of, you know, climate apocalypse stuff. Sit sit them down to to watch this or send them off to to actually investigate these issues for for themselves. Um we are in a a time in human history where our institutions uh, that we have relied upon to you know to, to keep things going they they just can no longer be trusted and 
uh, this is very discombobulating <laughs> because we, you know, ordinary people now have to put a lot more energy into figuring things out for themselves. And that, that includes, you know, interrogating a lot of different data sources and deciding, you know, what is actually, uh, reliable data, what, what, what can be trusted. Um, and I'm never going to say, Oh, trust me, you know, whatever comes out of my mouth, you, you should believe because, um, I, like everyone else, am, uh, uh, I'm limited, I'm fallible, but I do, you know, those of you who, who, uh, subscribe to my Substack, you'll know that, that I heavily, um, I, I, there, there are a zillion links in all of my articles. I reference everything that I say and, um, I urge you to click on those links and actually go to the original source material and verify that, 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 you know, what I've said is, is, is actually congruent with the original source. Um, and by the way, if anyone that you're reading or listening to or whatever doesn't do that, if they don't provide the source material, my question would be, why the hell are you taking them seriously? You know, mm. that's, that's not responsible. Everyone should be providing their, 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 the sources from which they got information so that other people can actually check that out. So, okay. Kevin, once again, thank you so much for your time. Um, I, I have the links to your website as well. I'll pop them in the, in, in the poster that will accompany this video. Is there any, any, any final words of wisdom, um, that, that you have or any advice that you'd like to, to give to people who have made it thus far? <laughs> I think you've covered it all, Robin, and, and uh, yeah, no, you've given very good advice. Uh, and I, I have to repeat, I'm very pleased to be on your show, and thank you very much for this opportunity. It's been an absolute pleasure. All right, Kevin, I hope we will be speaking again quite soon to, to pick up on some of the threads that we just pulled and then had to drop <laughs> so we weren't doing this for 12 hours rather than three. Okay. <laughs>